Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles, together in solo, and all things Beatles related too. I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. WFUV, by the way, is a non-commercial public radio station, and we're broadcasting at 90.7 FM in the New York City area and 90.7 FM HD2 as well. And you can listen online. Our website's WFUV.org or download our app and listen there. Um, And I'm the co-host of Things We Said Today. And joining me on each show are my my good friends, Ken Michaels, longtime radio. Why did I say that like it was a question mark? Like I wasn't (laughs) sure. Ken Michaels. He's a longtime radio personality, and he's dedicated virtually his entire 40-year broadcasting career to hosting Beatles programs. Some of Ken's years behind the mic were spent at XM Satellite Radio as well, and these days he hosts a syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing and the video cast Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Ken, how are you? I'm good. I spent my whole life doing nothing but Beatle work. That's it. And also, I haven't left this room. Actually, it looks like you've got uh, all your um, your worldly belongings behind you. Yes, yes, I do. Thank okay. you. Another uh, honeymooners also, reference there. <laughs> uh, also uh, with us, of course, is Alan Cozen, the acclaimed writer, journalist, and music critic, who has spent uh, who spent about forty years, give or take a few, with the New York Times, writing about classical music and the Beatles, of course, and over the years. He's contributed to many publications. He has an essential article out right now on George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, the 50th anniversary reissue. That's in the Wall Street Journal. He's written uh, numerous books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And it is uh, great to once again be hanging out, not only with Ken, but with Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Darren. How are you doing? All righty. And uh, before we mention what our topic is, which I'm sure you probably know (laughs) what it'll be, uh, let's go over to Ken, who has the news. Well, since we already did a show this week on the content for Bangladesh uh, four days ago, the news is very brief. This could be the shortest (laughs) (laughs) newscast. What's that? It's just going to be the weather and that's it. Okay. That might be too much at this point. Actually, we're going to start with some very good news. The McCartney 3 Imagine album is the first remix album to hit number one on Billboard's U.S. album top sales chart in 10 years. It's number one in album sales. It's number one. It's the number one rock album and the number one vinyl album. And it's on Billboard's top 200 charts where it debuts at number 19 pretty good right there i'm always happy just to see Mm -hmm. any beatles or solo beatle albums on the charts and uh let's hope that it has you know some kind of longevity you know most uh new albums by veteran artists stay on the charts for about four weeks we'll see how well this one does do we have Um, any idea i'm sorry ken do we have any idea what the colored vinyl did for both albums in the way of sales and positioning on the charts I don't have that information. I have information about how many sold in each category, but not each colored vinyl. So, but I will look into that and then probably have that for the next show. Uh, Paul reposted a photo of him getting vaccinated from a while back with the message, be cool, get vaxxed. No doubt, because of COVID cases rising and the Delta variant spreading, this is to encourage those that still haven't done so yet. Paul also sent out a video message wishing the great Tony Bennett a happy 95th birthday. Paul is quoted as saying, I get a kick out of Tony Bennett turning 95 today because I love him and his music and I love his son, Danny. Happy birthday, Tony. The legendary singer turned 95 on Tuesday this week. Together, they recorded the duet, The Very Thought of You. And unfortunately, sad news to report that the Fest for Beatle fans has been postponed until April 1st through the 3rd next year. 
at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson, of course, because of COVID spreading again. So um, I know so many people were looking forward to this. When things were tapering down uh, with COVID, you know, so many things were opening up, concerts, um, theater supposed to open up on Broadway. And yet uh, Mark Lapidos felt that it was only right to cancel the fest um, in October. We've all been waiting for quite a while. So, but I think he did the right thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, it's way too dangerous to be in enclosed quarters with so many people and so many problems that could come out of this whole thing. So um, I really think he made the right move. Yeah. And I don't envy him because you know how much he wanted to, to have it right. um, in October. And he's missed out on a lot of conventions now. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully it'll return uh, next April. That's all the news. I told you this was a very short newscast. I'm just going to like leave a little dead air in here so that we can. I'm just kidding. Uh, that <laughs> is short. Not a lot of news. Thank you, Ken. Um, well, we have more time to talk about our topic right now. And uh, today, tonight's topic, today's topic, this show's topic is uh, the 50th anniversary reissue of George Harrison's All Things Must Pass. Now, we um, are recording this on Friday, um, August 6th, and today's the day that uh, uh, the 50th anniversary editions of All Things Must Pass was released. And in fact, upstairs is my Uber box, which arrived this afternoon in the mail. So either tonight or tomorrow, I will have a grand opening in my uh, house of the Uber box. Um, but all configurations, whether you went with the CD or the LPs or the LP and the CDs and all that stuff came out today. And we wanted to do a show, um, you know, on the music in the box set uh, while everyone is cracking the plastic on, on, uh, on your copies. Um, the days, I guess, when you pre-order and get things either just before or on the, on the release date seem to be over with the way the mail is. I know that with, in the case of, um, I think, Ringo's EP and uh, probably both of Paul's albums, I didn't get my pre-orders on the day of release. I had to wait. So I'm sure some folks are just cracking the plastic now and are watching us a few days beyond um, mm. August 6th. But some so people have been about, getting some of those. Some people who've ordered Uber boxes have been getting them early. Yes. Uh, so actually, I think they started showing up over a week ago. That's right, some folks. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the word is that Alan is getting his tomorrow. Oh. Uh, and uh, I, I, it, I got a notification. I was getting a package, but I didn't recognize where it was coming from, so I was not expecting it to be. Uh, the box, but it arrived this afternoon. So well, I got so an email today. today. In the meantime, I got this one. You have <laughs> okay, so you got your hands on that. Which one are you now? Which uh, this what are you the, looking at there? What do you have there? This is the five C D one Blu-ray um I guess deluxe edition. Hmm. That's what I'll be getting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and I, I apologize in advance, folks. If you hear a lot of, I have a lot of crinkly paper notes here. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, th I made a detailed list of, of um, what configurations are out there for the sake of those who may, may not have ordered uh, your copy yet. You've got the Uber Deluxe Edition. I'm not sure if that's still available. I can't imagine that there were all that many made. Um, that's the big, big wooden box, the Uber Deluxe Edition. Then the 8LP Super Deluxe Edition and the, compa well, not the companion, the CD version of the Super Deluxe Edition is what Alan has, which in total is a six disc set, five CDs and one Blu-ray. So if you're not getting the Uber box, but you want the biggie, the Super Deluxe Editions are what you either bought or will buy eight LPs or six discs. Then it drops down to the deluxe editions, either a five LP box or a three CD set. 
And then it goes down to just the main album, uh, which is available individually as two CDs, three LPs, and they even uh, made a, a colored vinyl, triple LP. Um, and Target did a special, which I've ordered, but I'm not going to be getting that for a couple of weeks. Speak about things not arriving on the day of release. Mm. Uh, and I don't even remember what Target special is, but um, it's some, I don't know if it's vinyl. Target doing a colored vinyl or is it a, a colored CD package? I think I looked on their website and it said something about stickers. That's it. You That's stickers. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, something else I also noticed. Uh, but I don't know any uh, indie retailers who was um, selling this. Supposedly, there, will, uh, there was a, if you bought your copy in person at uh, an independent record store, they are, there are lithographs that oh. you can get for free, a lithograph. Wow. I'm not sure if it's the album cover or the poster of George, but that supposedly was something that was available today as well. So uh, I know it probably was a bit confusing, but that's all the configurations it is finally out. The 50th anniversary passed uh, this past November, uh, but better late than never. We're getting, thanks to COVID, the 50th anniversary release uh, today. Um, so I guess we'll do our usual thing and go around the horn and share our thoughts on all the music on this box set. I'll just start by saying this is one outstanding box, strictly talking about the music. This is terrific and could be, could be the way I feel right now. My favorite box set to come of all the ones that we've been talking about over the past few years. Um, so uh, let's see, alphabetical order, last name, K. We're going to start with Alan and Alan, share your thoughts about uh, the, uh, the audio. But I'm K. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Although today the way being alphab alphabetizing goes today, A is Alan, and you would well, you'd go first anyway. So there you All go. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know where to start. Uh, there is um, <coughs> the remix, um, which for I, I don't know. I mean, the more I'm listening to people talk about this and reading about it, the more I'm thinking that um, the remix is really the tail wagging the dog. Um, uh, everybody is really into the other three discs and I include myself there. I mean, there, it, all things must pass was, you know, we've, we've talked about it a lot in the past about whether or not um, Phil Spector sort of went over the top in his production. And, you know, there are arguments to be made both ways. Um, and one of the main arguments, I guess, is that uh, maybe he did, but that's what the album was at the time. And, you know, we have it. We've all been listening to it uh, for 50 years and um, have been mostly um, pretty happy with it. Um, uh, but, you know, George Harrison himself said, you know, if, if he, he was thinking of remixing it and getting rid of some of the excesses and, uh, you know, I think also once we heard some of the, uh, bootlegs from these sessions, um, you know, beware of Abco and songs for Patty and, uh, you know, where we've heard, the pre-spectorized, you know, demos and, and things, uh, I think that sort of ratcheted up the idea that, you know, maybe this album, you know, could be better in a different form, you know, remixed and getting rid of some of that stuff. Um, from our discussion, you know, before the, the cameras went on, um, I gather that, uh, Darren feels it's more despectorized than I do. Um, uh, they did get rid of some reverb on some songs. I think on other songs it was baked in uh, and there's not that much you can do. And uh, they moved some placements around. They suppressed some instruments. And the one that I guess bothers me the most is Wawa. Um, in the beginning of Wawa, you know, every, a few bars into the song, the piano comes in and it's like one of these, like, you know, da, 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 uh, I should turn it on. <laughs> um, you know, uh, 
it's it's a nice effect and in the remix it's basically gone i mean it, i guess it's in there but it, but it, it doesn't it doesn't hit you the way it does uh, on the on the original mix and um, also some acoustic guitars at the beginning of um, All Things Must Pass too. Um, so some things are missing and for me, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not going to make a, a federal case of it. Um, but, you know, there are some things, there are a lot of things I like in the remix better. I mean, and, and generally speaking, um, it sounds warmer to me and, and more clear textured. Harrison's voice is uh, a bit more out front, um, which is, you know, something that um, Yoko and uh, Sean have done with the Lennon remixes too, um, uh, brought the vocals out more. Uh, and you know, in there was we've we've seen some correspondence from Phil Spector uh, to George. It's not included in the booklets that come with these things, but um, where you know Spector is giving him notes on the mixes and uh, saying he wants him to bring the vocals out more. Uh, he says that this this will make it clear how great the songs are if 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 the voice is more up front. Um, and I think they're finally getting around to doing that now. Um, I don't think, uh, I, I don't know whether George did it enough to satisfy Spectre or not, but, um, but now it's a bit more. Um, then there's the, uh, you know, two discs of demos, which, you know, fundamentally are the despectorized version in a way. And you want this album without Spectre's excesses, play those two discs, um, because in addition, to the entire album, you get um, 13 more songs that George didn't include. And um, some of them are really quite good songs. Some of them uh, turned up later. Uh, also, there's a, a disc of outtakes, which has um, you know, uh, other things that have turned up later and some things that are just jokes. Uh, you know, Woman Don't Cry For Me turned up uh, several albums later. Um, I think on the demos, there's a, I, I don't want to do it. Uh, and there's, mm -hmm. there's you. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's uh, like with, uh, like with the Easter tapes, you know, you, you get some songs that will start turning up years and years later. Um, a lot of these, you know, we've known um, partly from things like songs for Patty uh, and uh, beware of Abco, but also um, uh, when, a while back, there was sort of a, an archival dump from what was uh, Ken, Ken, Kevin, mm, it's a British DJ, uh, Scott. <laughs> I forget his first name. Okay. Roger Scott. Um, you know, and, uh, and those things started pouring out and, and, a, and a few of these did, including uh, going down to Golders Green and, and Gopala Krishna uh, some things that aren't on here, like the uh, Pete Drake uh, demonstrating his uh, vocal vocoder kind of thing with uh, guitar, that Peter Frampton, who played on these sessions, eventually picked up. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty that one isn't on. It's not no great shakes, but it, it does have some historical weight, you know, because of where it ended up. Um, yeah, there's um, a bit of an outtake of Get Back. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't think they really explain in the book that um, I think that was actually for the sessions he was producing for Doris Troy, you know, basically running through that arrangement that he was doing for her. Um, but that's here too. There's uh, Wedding Bells are breaking up this old gang of mine, which... Um, is you know in a way a little bit pertinent in a funny way uh the beatles breaking up um uh, so yeah it's just like there's a lot of treasures here and uh you know so for an overview i mean maybe we'll get more specific later but um i'll turn it over to the next person in alphabetical order <laughs> <laughs> First of all, let me let me just correct you for for one second, Alan. Okay. You, you mentioned you as a demo. Hmm. I think you meant if not for you, because oh, 
George okay, did. You know what I'm thinking about <laughs> bootlegs. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting uh, these things conflated. Um, there, there is a, a, a bootleg outtake of you from these right. sessions. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. They should have included that too. <laughs> It gets a little confusing with you because that, I believe, is really from the Ronnie Spector sessions, which mm -hmm. happened after the All Things Must Pass sessions. I think that was in the very beginning of 1971, mm -hmm. but yet it's turned up. Um, maybe it was songs for Patty. I'm trying to remember. But uh, yeah, um, I would pretty much agree with so much of what Alan said. Um, whenever it comes to any of these box sets, I immediately go first to the outtakes into the demos and early takes and i don't care as much about the remixes just to tell you the truth that's just the way that i am in part because i've always been happy with the original mixes of beetle and solo beetle albums but i do spend some time listening to the remixes so and i'm not one of those people that uh, is on the anti phil specter bandwagon i think the work that he did with George, and by the way, I highly recommend the book that Ken Womack wrote with Jason Krupa, All Things Must Pass Away, because George was very much involved with this album all the way with, with Phil Spector. It's not like Phil was in total control of everything. They worked together, and even after Phil left, and actually it was temporary, he did come back, but George did a lot of overdubbing later on, so everything that went out was as George approved it back then. Sure. And it's, it's fine that right before he died, he did say that maybe they should remove some reverb. It was too heavy. That's how he felt then. But to me, I've always loved the original mix and I would even go so far as to call it, you know, production wise, a masterpiece. I think it's probably the greatest along with let it be, you know, the greatest accomplishment that uh, Phil Spector did after his heyday of the mid sixties, those two, um, I would barely change a hair on all things must pass. So it's nice to have a, a remix. And, um, I didn't notice too many differences myself. We'll talk about it, I guess, um, as we go along here in the remix, but the real treasures to me are those three discs. And like Alan said, I think for everybody that wants as little Phil Spector production as possible, you're going to love those three discs. And I'm sure many of you know the Beware of Apco uh, bootleg anyway, but my God, I mean, just as an example on the outtakes, there's a take of Wawa, which is almost identical to the album without any Phil Spector production. It's just the band. So I think for people who crave that kind of thing, there's quite a bit of that here on those three discs. And I think that you'll be, you know, very pleased with uh, with what you're going to hear on those three discs. And, you know, if you want me to talk about the remixes now, I'll do that. I don't know if we all want to just talk about it, you know, in particular. I know Alan just did. What do you yeah, think, no, Darren? Well, yeah. Go, do, do, finish your thought about the remixes. Well, the remixes to me and to be fair, I only listened once all the way through. And I didn't listen to the Apple Jam at all because that was just remastered. It wasn't remixed. But, you know, for my ears, what I noticed was that the lead vocals were pushed up a little bit. They also seemed like they were more isolated from the rest of the tracks that you can really hear George's vocals and, and also that they were dry. I didn't really hear that much reverb on the lead vocals. And every now and then on certain tracks, they'll boost up some other instrument. But for the most part, that was the main difference there. Um, I wish I could say so much more, but for people who want George's vocals to be more in the clear, they'll enjoy this more. But I don't think that the differences were that drastic, at least. And it's not fair of me to say this, to be fair, because like I said, I only listened to this once. I want to give you an example of something here. I don't think I brought this up, but when Give Me Some Truth came out, the compilation, the first time I listened to it was in my car and I have a, a car that's a few years old with Bose speakers and everything. And I was really looking forward to listening to it. And I was really disappointed because even though I heard John's vocals more boosted up, it seemed like a very flat signal to me. It didn't have that great dynamic range. Then 
I take, took the same disc, put them in my stereo here, listen with my headphones on, and it sounded wonderful, you know? And I really love the sound coming out of my stereo here. So a lot depends upon the equipment that you're using. Um, so it's not really fair for me to judge so early about these remixes, but the way that I look at it, you know, I've loved the original mix. You can't go wrong with the or original mix. This is an alternative and I'm going to listen to it more and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll grow to appreciate it more. It'll be very tough for me to ever prefer a remix over the original, but that's just the way that I feel. I thought you were going to break into song there and start singing the Ambrosia song. That's how much. <laughs> um, <No>. Listening to the two of you talk about your thoughts on the remix reminds me of a lot of the stuff I felt with the white album remix. Um, that th there were enough kind of little differences in the mix of the, of the white album remix that made me feel the original should be nearby or included. Um, I, do I want so much tinkering being done with the original that I felt was done with the White Album? There was less of that with Abbey Road, the Abbey Road remix. Yeah. Um, and that brings us to this one. Uh, my initial thoughts were, I didn't, I feel that this is very, despectorized uh or perhaps i wasn't expecting it to be despectorized at all so i was it immediately surprised me at how how many differences i was picking up um right off the bat i mean my notes here right off the bat i'd have you anytime it says the new mix is immediately apparent i mean the the beginning the guitar at the beginning of the album on oh, i'd have you anytime is much sharper and clearer, be it like layers of reverb or, or either taken away or at least suppressed. And that made me go, I better listen to the remix closer because I have a feeling there's going to be more subtle nuances that are going to be different with this 2020 mix as opposed to the original and the remaster from 2000. Um, and I was right. And I, and I made little random notes on some of the tracks here. Um, just a sidebar, the one common denominator to me throughout all the discs is George Harrison's singing is outstanding. His vocals are off the charts good. And I think that does get lost on the original album from 50 years ago because there's so much going on in the mm. final production. The way this is done is, as you pointed out, Ken, it's cleaned up and the vocal is pretty much throughout the main album. The vocals are brought up front and they stand out from the the, the, the instruments, the instrumentation. Mm. And the strong vocals, that continues through the demos. And uh, we well, really get to hear how how strong of a vocalist George really is, which I think maybe we take that for granted. Uh, but it's on display throughout uh, all of these discs. And again, with the main album, it's the way the mix is handled, that George's vocal is put up front. I made that note for My Sweet Lord. Vocals are more up front. Uh, for Wawa, the mix is cleaner and clearer. But I, f I felt the Spectre production there. However they do this, it just came across much more... Well, cleaner and clearer. Mm. Um, on What Is Life, there's a, a little bit of an additional slide guitar bit that was lost in the original mix or taken away. I that wrote that down. Out. Uh, yeah. In fact, it's, it's sort of, it appears we know it. And, you know, that I think it's the part that goes... Well, before that, there's some more of that that either was removed or buried in the original mix that jumps right out. Those were the things that I wasn't expecting as much of. Um, and while I'm listening to it the first time, the 2020 mix, I'm really getting caught up in these little 
little subtle nuances that are coming at me with every track. Um, if not for you and behind that locked door, I put down here that those two songs are a very good example of the cleaner vocals of the, uh, of the remix. Mm -hmm. um, then a song like Let It Down, Spectre's production is there. It hasn't been taken away. It's almost like with that track, it seems let it let it down. I felt like it was, there it is, here it is. You filled Spectre fans, he's still here. And it was on Let It Down that jumped out at me. Uh, I detected some additional horns on Run of the Mill that may have been uh, taken away on the original uh, version of the album. Uh, Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp, those deep backing vocals are much clearer. Uh, and plus, there's well, that, oh, Sir Frankie yeah. Crisp. Yeah, you, I made a note to say, I think I can hear George in that. Now, just to get ahead of myself, later on, I guess it's in the demos. Um, I think it's in the demos here. I'll get to it eventually, but there's it's it, it's got to be in the demos where it really sounds like that's Mal Evans. Yeah, I'm singing sure that that's what part. It is. So yeah. perhaps the finished mix that we got on the original album maybe was both of them, because mm -hmm. uh, I thought I detected George's vocal clearer on the main album, but later in the demos. It's pretty obvious that's, at least in that case, it was Mal Evans doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sir Frankie Crisp. I think that's covered in the Ken Womack book with Jason Krupa. I think uh, they mentioned that it's Mal Evans. And just going through the rest of the album, Awaiting on You All, I made a note, Spectre Productions, and it seems to be a little more intact on that one. Uh, the vocal on All Things Must Pass is fantastic. That, I guess, would be an, an example of a... Uh, one where the voice is really maybe boosted up a little more towards the front. Um, the Isn't It a Pity version two, um, backing instrument, the backing instruments, backing instrumentation does sound a little different to me. George's vocal did as well. Don't know if that was just, you know, my, my ears playing tricks on me and, uh, Finally, then with Hear Me, Lord, I made a note that the slide guitar really jumps out and uh, the vocals sound so passionate uh, due to this, again, cleaner mix. Um, so the main album, the 18 George songs, sides one through four, were remixed. You mentioned uh, in passing before, Ken, as for Apple Jam, I didn't listen to it because it states that it's pretty much just a straight remaster of the original mixes from 1970. So, um, and they have been put back in the order that they appeared in 1970 on Apple Jam. If you remember, George's kind of reimagining of All Things Must Pass in 2000, uh, it was retitled Original Jam, and the track order was changed to the order, I guess, mm. that the songs were recorded. Something uh, like okay. that, where Out of the Blue was, I think, at the end. Yeah. And uh, it's Johnny's birthday was first. Apple Jam here on this new 50th anniversary is put back in the order that we first heard it back in 1970, not what George did in 2000. But the Apple Jam part, just a straight remaster. And I didn't really spend any time um, listening to it, at least not yet. Um, so I was curious to see if they would take any of the echo that is throughout Apple Jam on the original, um, which I always thought was a little, sounded a little odd because jams are supposed to be raw. And it was clear that Apple Jam in 1970 was specterized. Uh, and I thought maybe they would clean mm -hmm. off some of the reverb. And although I didn't listen to it, I assume they didn't because it's a remaster and not a remix. So, yeah, you know, those are my thoughts on, uh, on, on the uh, on the main album, the 2020 remix, in a nutshell, I feel like uh, a lot of it was cleaned up. Uh, Spectre's production still there, but it's not the first thing that you hear on most tracks. Uh, the thing that really jumps out at me is George's vocal really shines on virtually every song um, on the album. It's it's the same difference as the White Album remix. 
you'll hear some ears might hear other things that I didn't pick up. It's a different presentation of the same thing. You'll notice differences. Are they enough to turn off the person who wants things to be the same? I'm not sure. They might be. But I really, really enjoyed it. And I was pleasantly surprised uh, at how much I enjoyed uh, this new look uh, at, the, at the main album. There was one other Maybe. aspect um, of it, which is um, I did a lot of A-B comparisons with two, you know, side by side and then sequentially, you know, first the old one, then the new one uh, to take notes. And a lot of the instrument placements are different, too. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's just the opposite of the original one. You know, you'll get like, uh, you know, uh, bass on weighted towards the left on the original album and maybe the, the rhythm guitar on the right, and it'll be just the opposite on, uh, on the remix. Um, not in every I wonder case. why. I don't I know why I think, they would do I, that. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal, but um, it's just one of those things that if you're listening side by side, you notice, that, you know, that was over there and now it's over here, you know. And those, that's probably what, what played into me picking out these little subtle nuances that sound completely different to me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or maybe there's a riff and you only heard the second half of the riff. Well, the first half might be there that you didn't hear it originally. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would be from the result of maybe the placement may, may, may have made, uh, made it a bit clearer. Yeah, listen, I never heard the Oh, Sir Frankie Crisp on the original yeah. album. Yeah, uh, I never I've, did either. And I've gone back and looked for it. You know, I can't I can't find it. I mean, it may be there uh, that, you know, once you have something like that in your ear, you can think you hear it. Uh, and no, I, are you saying that you've never heard period the vocal? Yeah. Or you've never that just that bit that Oh, Sir Frankie. So clear, though, because it, you can hear it on. On the original? On the original. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. See, wow. I haven't. I, I, I've never heard that. Oh, sir. Before. No. See, that was always, yeah, that always irritated me a little bit about that song. Really? Uh, and I was always wondering what they were saying, because mm. the beginning of the it's so the, buried, the, yeah. the beginning of the verse is buried. Yeah. But then you hear that. It, oh, Frank, you crisp. I think, you know, it, it may be partly because it's so clear on the demo and also he does it again. And I think I think it's beautiful girl. There is one of the um, outtakes yeah. has basically the same chords. Um, and so he everybody, did, nobody. Yep. Yeah, oh, OK. So he did it there, uh, you know, I guess as a as a little inside joke, um, not thinking anybody would be hearing it uh, 50 years later. Um, but I have a feeling that because those two things are there, they, they brought it up a bit in the mix of the finished track. So, so that, you know, you could see where it went. Um, but it, and for um, those it, who don't know that for, for Sir Frankie Crisp owned Friar Park or had it built. What was the story with him? I think both. And yes. he had kind of, I think, a crazy kind of wacky sense of humor. This, the architecture and the uh, on of the way it was, uh, some of the designs were kind of quirky. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, he designed the gardens and he put all these weird sayings up on the grounds there, um, which George used in some of the songs. Yeah, like the answers at the end. If you look in um, Chris O'Dell's memoir, um, she talks about um, a party that George threw right after they moved in and set up um, where people are going down in the like, you know, catacomb like, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's more than a basement, uh, you know, I guess it's catacombs um, where he had all kinds of other stuff going on in there and they just sort of brought people in there to to show them it. Um, so yeah, he was, uh, apparently very quirky. Yeah. English lawyer and microscopist. What is a microscopist? <laughs> You're saying it right? Check, uh, someone who uses microscopes. All right. Frank Crisp. Yep. So he wasn't, so he wasn't Frankie. George turned him into Frankie. Right. Frank Crisp. 
Sure. All right. Uh, anyway, so now uh, I guess now that's the main album. So that that this will continue. This will fuel the ongoing debate about remixing older works. Do you like it? Do you not like it? Should we not be messing with, um, you know, revisionist history? Should we not be messing with uh, things that we've heard for decades? I think uh, that's a debate that is one for another time. And I think it also depends on what you're talking about, even outside of the world of the Beatles, you yeah. know, and is the remix drastic or is it subtle and whatnot, but the debate will continue on with uh, with the uh, 2020 mix of All Things Must Pass, which is the first talking CDs, the first two discs. I think it's the first the th first three LPs, if you go the route of mm -hmm. the LP. Um, so I guess we should go into the, the three discs that come next that really has uh, the meat and potatoes that got Ken and, and Alan all excited. I don't know if you want to pick up, Alan, with your thoughts on the two discs of demos and the uh, session outtakes and jams disc. Sure. Um, I, I, I also would like to say just a couple of words about the jams. You know, they're not different. They're not remixed. Um, but, you know, when, when the album came out, I, I probably listened to the jam disc once or twice and then just sort of put it in its sleeve and, and left it in the box and listened to the songs for the rest of the time. Um, and also similarly with each reissue of All Things Must Pass, of which this is like the 25th, I'm exaggerating. Um, but if you remember, um, the first time it came out on CD, in the middle of one of the sides, there was a huge volume drop. So that was the first one and everyone complained about it and they took it off and they replaced it with one where the volume was consistent all the way through. So that's two. Uh, you know, then there's the 2001, the 2014 one, and now this. So I've, I probably listened to it maybe once or twice each time it came out. Um, listen to it again this time, you know, just because even though I knew it wasn't remixed, I, I just sort of um, was fascinated by the idea. I mean, always have been that he would include a third disc with jams, because unless you're the Allman Brothers, you know, you don't put your studio jams in the album. Um, and I've got to say, you know, listening to it closely this time, um, I really like them. I mean, there is, a, first of all, I mean, you've got an incredible band of musicians here and they're just sort of, you know, letting loose and reacting to each other. And uh, they really are interesting jams. And, and maybe another reason that I listened um, more closely is that there are, a couple more jams, um, you know, on the third disc, the, um, mm. well, the fifth disc, the third disc of previously unreleased material. Um, and, you know, so you, you get this idea that like during these sessions in between things, they were just sort of, um, you know, just jamming away and, uh, and, and having a good time. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's definitely part of it it's 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 an asterisk but it's it's part of the of, of the set too i mean it's it, every time george has redone it it's been um you know he he hasn't said let me get rid of the jams this time you know he's he's included them every time you're my cat uh, I yes <laughs> your cat wants to chime in here with some thoughts about apple jam it could be because um he listened to him again just this morning. <laughs> um, so, you know, the uh, I, I, I think I said, you know, some a bunch of what I have to say about the demos. Um, I, there are some things like um, I Dig Love. I actually like the demo a lot more than the finished version. Oh. Um, it's a it's a, a very different arrangement. Uh, and uh, I I. I I think it kind of works. And um, I did love was, you know, maybe in the, the, the bottom reaches of if I were to um, list the songs on the album by, you know, favorite, less favorite, whatever. I did love, eh, you know, but the demo was um, a lot of fun. Um, I uh, probably otherwise, you know, focused more on the things that weren't on the finished album. I really like going down to Golders Green um, it's a uh, very rockabilly and, uh, 
it's also kind of funny. There's, a, you know, just little jokes that George has various places. I mean, Golders Green in London is a very Jewish area. So when, you know, he gets to the verse where he says, you know, and on Sunday, I'm the only one at mass, you know, it's, it's kind <laughs> of, a, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if that means much to people, especially in the U.S., you know, to to British people that might that might jump out as, you know, a funny line. Um, but, uh, you know, but I but I just like the feel of it. You know, I kind of wish he had included it. Um, or maybe done it up again for another album, uh, like some of these things. Um, let's see. Uh, also like Gopala Krishna and Dara Dune. Dara Dune especially, I guess. I like that. You know, Dara Dune seems similar to me in spirit to Any Road on Brainwashed. You know, just oh. this idea of there's many, many ways to get places and, you know, uh, you, you sort of take the road that you, that you need to. Um, and let's see. Yeah. The outtakes, you know, um, some of them were funny, you know, another one of his humorous things, there's an outtake of, um, isn't it a pity? And, and he uh, talks about, you know, isn't it a pity that we do so many takes? You know? <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, <clears throat> Woman Don't Cry For Me, I, I think is, uh, you know, the slide guitar version on, on disc five is, is really good. Uh, I kind of like that better than the fuller production that he eventually did. Um, Mother Divine doesn't do that much for me. Same with Cosmic Empire. Um, tell me what has happened to you. Sounds like, um, it sounds like it's not really finished. Um, but just musically, it has this chromatic thing going on that's unlike almost anything George did otherwise. And I, I kind of wish he'd finished it and, and done something with more with it because um, it looked like he was onto a, a sort of interesting idea. Um, yeah, so I think of, of the extras. Uh, the only other thing that I would say is um, run of the mill on the uh, fifth disc, the outtake has a kind of interesting guitar introduction that they ultimately dumped. Um, and I kind of like it, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be able to hear that they were exploring that. I, I probably, it's to some degree wish that they had continued along those lines, but I, I like the finished version too. So, um, you know, that's the thing with, outtakes and even remixes you know the the original theoretically is always there i don't know are they leaving the original all things must pass in print you know they should uh, yeah and, and they should yeah. find a way to distinguish but well i mean this one says 50th anniversary on the cover um you know i think you should be able to have it both ways the same as you do with the uh uh, remix of uh, Double Fantasy that Yoko did, totally different, mm. you know, in sound and spirit. And uh, when it came out, I thought it was really interesting. I have to admit, um, I very rarely play that one. If I want to hear Double Fantasy, I usually play the actual Double Fantasy album. Um, I'm not sure what will be the case with this, except that this one also comes with a 5.1 surround. And I'm a sucker for that. So it's very possible that I'll be listening to the remix more just because I can play that version. I think it's interesting you held it up there. And again, Alan, you have, I got to look. I can't believe I have to look up. You have the six disc, right? The five CD yeah. Blu-ray box there. Yeah. So that's, if you didn't go for the $1,000 Uber camper, of a box set, okay? Which I think might be the biggest, most expensive box set I've seen yet by any artist. I could be wrong about that, but okay. Now you drop down to the Super Deluxe and that's a small box set. Mm -hmm. Hold that up again, Alan. That's that's not a, like a 12 by 12. It's smaller than the Plastic Ono Band box set, which was a little, smaller than you know, that. smaller. 
It's that's like ten by seven. Looks like a real to real box. Yeah. Or it's a size of maybe a little bigger than a single. That's you know. pretty interesting. So yeah. we'll go from yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. anyway. I'll have a better idea of that tomorrow. Um, I still have no idea where I'm going to put it. But, you'll uh, hear early in the morning, you'll hear a truck outside. Beep, beep, beep. Backing up into your driveway to, mm -hmm. to drop it off. Mm -hmm. um, Ken, you want to um, go into the... Uh, yeah, sure. Before I do, um, since you were talking about the stripped down release, Alan, from uh, John and Yoko, mm -hmm. interesting thing about that is that when that was released, they packaged both albums together. Right. The original mix and the stripped down version. Mm -hmm. So that way, you know, you can always have both at the same time. And I'd have to imagine that the original mix of All Things Must Pass is always going to stay out there. Mm -hmm. It should be, no matter what. Um, yeah, as far as the other discs are concerned, there's so many great highlights. And um, I love the fact that the first disc of demos is, it, for the most part, not all of them, but it's a band yeah. arrangement of demos, whereas the second disc is is almost all, I believe, just acoustic George yeah, I alone. Have the, I have the breakdown of that, uh, which I'll get into later. Yeah, so I love the contrast there. It's kind of like what Paul did with Flowers in the Dirt, the demos, the Elvis Costello demos with the band and the, and the demos of just Paul and Elvis together acoustically. But um, among the things that I liked a lot, there are times in these demos where you could hear george hum part of the melody of what was going to be played instrumentally like on behind that locked door he's actually like singing the solo of what pete drake would play mm -hmm. um and likewise on isn't it a pity he's singing the the orchestral solo um when the strings come in da 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 da, -da. that part um, so it just tells you that George already knew in the back of his head what he wanted to hear. So you learn that from uh, listening to these demos. I have always loved I Live For You. And, um, you know, I love the version that came out with the 2000, 2001 uh, um, remaster, which was fixed up. I think there was some overdubbing done there. Maybe Danny Harrison added to it. Um, this was more of the original and I wish that they had really worked on it back then. And, you know, I've often said, I think that that really did belong on the album. Apple Scruffs. I love to listen to because it's so close to the original. Um, what is life is killer. The demo of that. It doesn't have horns at all. It really rocks. So um, you're so used to hearing the horns in, in the song that when you're hearing just the band play it, it has a whole different vibe altogether. Um, I'd have you any time. I like a lot the demo. It's just George on electric guitar alone, which is kind of like the demo of something, you know, which is on the anthology collection. It's nice to hear George just play the electric guitar. I do like I Dig Love, as Alan said. So it's more of a rocking version and you don't hear the uh, the piano notes, the descending notes, and then the ascending notes. Da 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 da. -da. That was developed later. They're just rocking throughout this whole thing, and I do like that arrangement. Don't know if I necessarily like it better, but it's just interesting to know that they changed the arrangement of that song. And yeah, going down to Golden's Green is a real treat. Really sounds like a song that Elvis Presley would have done in the fifties, and very much the the guitar playing, the the lead guitar playing that George did is kind of like what he did in the Beatles copying Carl Perkins or like what Scotty Moore would play on an Elvis song in the fifties. Um, and it works, you know, um, you could even hear Elvis sing a song like that. I do love Dara Dune and Gopala uh, Krishna. Um, My sweet Lord is interesting. It's the band, but it doesn't have the famous guitar riff on there. And I found it interesting that there's actually a demo of Sour Milk Sea. Mm -hmm. Like, where did that come from? I mean, we have the demo from the White Album demos, but I guess at the time you felt like playing it in the studio. 
Unless maybe he, he was considering it. Maybe he was considering giving it another, yeah. you know, giving it another run and hmm. doing it himself. It's an acoustic demo. Not that that means anything. I mean, so, you know, it might have been maybe he was going to do thought about doing a different arrangement. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That I find interesting, you know, knowing that the Jackie Lomax version came out already. But yeah, I, I just found that fascinating. Um, one of the mill is the uh, the same one that's on early takes volume one. <clears throat> I like hearing Art of Dying and all that without the brass. Um, and also, I, I like everything on, <laughs> on the Beware of Abco disc. Window Window, I think, is an excellent song. Um, very Dylan-esque. Uh, some of these songs I wish that he worked on more. Um, Wawa is um, just an electric guitar and somebody playing the bass. I'm not sure. It's just interesting to hear that song without a full band. Um, Beautiful Girl. Nice to hear that version, knowing that, you know, kind of like Woman, Don't You Cry For Me, it ended up on 33 and a third. And uh, missing some of the lyrics of what, what ended up on the Finnish song. Beware of Darkness is great. You know, he sings Beware of Avco on there. That was also on the 2001 remaster. Let It Down is the same one on the 2001 um, remaster. Uh, tell me what has happened to you. I kind of agree with you, Alan. I, I find it really interesting. The chords that he uses, that they sound like they're all diminished chords, which mm-hmm. he is the king of. But he didn't really work all that much on the lyrics. I think if he had worked on that, that he could have developed a really good song out of it. Um, Hear Me, Lord. On electric guitar, just George on electric guitar and nobody else. I love it. I love the whole demo of Hear Me, Lord. Uh You know, that's a very overlooked song for me. And when the band's doing it and it doesn't have the Phil Spector arrangement, it's going on for like eight minutes. To me, that's heaven. Um, Nowhere to go, which I didn't really know until uh, just recently that he wrote that with Bob Dylan. It's funny, some of the lyrics that he put in there about being called uh, Beetle Jeff or Beetle Ted. Um, and I do think the Cosmic Empire had possibilities had he worked on it. Very catchy song. Um, it just needed some more work. I can hear a band arrangement to Cosmic Empire. More the Divine as well. And it's also interesting to know that he did I Don't Want to Do It as early as this time. Um, resurrected it later for Porky's Revenge. And... Uh, you know, uh, and the nice acoustic version of If Not For You. Um, and then we got all the outtakes. Uh, like I said, Wawa, big highlight for me. Um, there's another outtake of What Is Life, which is outstanding. Again, no horns on that. Um, Let It Down, the outtake of that I love a lot because it's a real soft, more gentle version of Let It Down, whereas the version that we've known all these years has such a big band sound kicking in from the very beginning. And this has a totally different feel altogether. Um, Run of the mill is interesting. Like you said, Alan, Um, interesting to know that he used the the dual guitar lines instead of using horns in the very beginning, also much faster than the version that we've come to know all these years. Just interesting to know how the, how the arrangement changed um almost 12 bar honky tonk is something that could have fit right on apple jam um i actually enjoyed it quite a lot which makes me wonder i should give apple jam more of a chance it's johnny's birthday is actually a little bit different because the version that's on here is without any um pitch adjustment because on the version that was on the original album they sped up the song towards the end and uh, I do like Women Don't You Cry For Me. I love the version on 33 and a third, but this version is really cool with just acoustic guitar and a lot of slide guitar work. Um, and there was a version that appeared on Early Takes uh, Volume 1, um, which is shorter and a different take altogether, but very much in this style. It kind of works this way as well. Sounds like a you know 30s, 40s country song, uh-huh. like a Hank Williams kind of thing. Uh, yeah, there's so much to, to revel in here. Um, one thing that I did note was, yeah, and I do like wedding bells. 
that was a nice uh, little jam that they put in there. I do like, um, I know I was going to say, um, the song I'll Still Love You also came from these sessions, which he later gave to Ringo for Ringo's Rotogravure. And I'm a little surprised that nothing was made of that. But they really give you quite a lot for these three discs. And so uh, I couldn't be happier, really. You look very happy, Ken. <laughs> um, a lot of what I wanted to point out are points that uh, the two of you have made. Uh, so forgive me if I, you know, say the same thing. Uh, going back to what I said earlier on, I mean, right off, I made a note here that George vocals are fantastic and they shine on, on these two discs of demos. Uh, and especially in the case of um, the first disc of demos, uh, many of the versions there I felt could have been released and it would have been a killer album. Um, those versions that are marked as demos. Now, uh, disc three and disc four are the two discs of demos that we've just been talking about. And um, I found it interesting uh, that it, they're grouped by day. Now, I don't know the answer to this. I'll ask the two of you, or maybe someone can answer this. Did George do two days worth of demos and that was it? I mean, unless he did some at home as well, but he he that's the way he's presented here. at Abbey Road. Yeah. Yeah, well, and sorry, then he did two days of demos at Abbey Road, uh, and these oh. are those. And then the next day, um, they started the session. Work. I got you. Okay, so disc three is day yeah. one and dated Tuesday, May 26th. And uh, that tended to be more, uh, as you pointed out, Ken, more of a band. Um, oh. it, much more, of, it was a ba band going through uh, these songs, and um. The, the notes I, I pointed out, I mean, I'd love to take one of All Things Must Pass, um, which just outstanding, stripped, kind of kind of stripped down, uh, more straightforward performance of that. Um, behind that locked door, uh, another one, I make it a point here to say I love the drum sound. Do we know if that's Ringo playing on those uh, first couple of tracks on disc three, day one, demos day one? I think so. I think it's it sounds Ringo. like Ringo's playing. Ringo uh, and uh, Klaus Foreman on bass. Um, George also says, "Go, Pete." On <laughs> yeah. on yeah. Uh, behind that locked door, I'm assuming he's uh, making a reference or talking to Pete Drake. Uh, I would think no. so. Yeah. Um, I live for you. I actually prefer this demo to the version that was included as a bonus track on the 2000 uh, version of All Things Must Pass. Um, How come? I'm sorry? How come? Um, I don't know. Oh, so I don't remember now. All I wrote here is prefer to 2000 release <laughs> version. It doesn't um, sound finished. Yeah, maybe that's version. that could be why I, I liked it a little bit. Uh, well, the pedal steel I wasn't too nuts about on the uh, 2000 version, which I guess that's as finished of a version that we're going to ever hear. Uh, mm. I preferred it without the pedal steel, which mm. I don't think is there on, on this demo version. Um, what is life? You guys pointed out what is life is so cool. It rocks. It's better without the horns. Um, uh, especially with the unused, very busy horn uh, parts that were included as, uh, as 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 an instrumental bonus track on the 2000 version, where the mm. horns are much more busier, much more Tijuana brass. Uh, I <laughs> well, like what is life with no horns uh, and more guitar. Um, that version from the the 2001 remaster has got the same horns that you heard in the, in the release version, but there yeah. were parts that ended up getting buried, so right. you heard the whole thing. Yeah, so but, yeah, there was more of it. There was the, they were busier essentially. Yeah. Uh, but right out, I mean, I prefer much preferred it uh, here in demo form without the horns. Um, there's a count into I dig love and like uh, Alan pointed out, not one of one of maybe one of my least favorite songs on the album. Uh, but here, kind of takes on um, a new life. Uh, it rocks more 
here in the demo form. I dig love. Uh, going down to Golders Green, I agree with everything you guys said. It was It's like George's rockabilly tune. Even uh, goes into a little bit of an Elvis Presley kind of impersonation there. I could also have heard Johnny Cash doing that song. Um, and uh, Dara Dune, which is take two. And Om Hare Om. Say it, Ken. What's the in the parentheses? Gopala Krishna. Gopala Krishna. Okay. That, I love those two. Mm. And it, it almost made me wish, you know, too bad George wasn't a little bolder with his spiritual side because wouldn't an album of that stuff have been very interesting or at least yeah. have uh, like a, a double album where he was bringing those Indian, heavily Indian influenced songs uh, in uh, with the, uh, with his uh, regular tunes as secular songs. Uh, you know, I, I've often said that because I love it is he Jay Sri Krishna mm -hmm. on dark horse to get a whole album of that. I would have killed for it. Yeah. But I know a lot of people that kind of turned off by that. So, you know, everyone's got a mixed reaction. So. Right. And um, he, here's where the uh, the uh, day one of demo or day one of demos version of Ballad of Sir Frankie Crisp. Let it roll. I said, is that Mal on vocals? Um, all told, I loved disc three, the day, the first day of demos. Disc two, if you know Beware of Abco, that is what day two of demos is. Mm. Uh, and that is almost entirely in ac acoustic. Um, I made a note here. Uh, day two demos was Wednesday, May 27th, which we've known as the bootlegged uh, Beware of Abco. Um most of these songs are acoustic except Wawa, Take One, which is an electric guitar and bass. Mm. I don't know who's playing bass. Um, and then we have Hear Me Lord, Take One, and Nowhere to Go, Take One. Those are electric. Uh, everything else is acoustic on uh, Demos Day 2. And... Um, that was a little more of a subdued, relaxed listen for me. Uh, the the versions of the songs were fairly faithful to how George did them uh, when he recorded them for the album. And you get some gems like Window Window, which I could swear was written by Bob Dylan. That is mm -hmm. such a great Bob Dylan song from George. Window Window and Beautiful Girl. You could tell he still had some more work to do on the lyrics. It's kind of unfinished. Um, but it's nice having... Heard Beautiful Girl on 33 and a Third for so many years, hearing it now in stripped down form and how it could have slotted in to what all things must pass ended up being. Um, and uh, basically, you know, I, I'm going to repeat everything that you guys said about that, uh, that, that second disc of demos. The uh, disc, fifth disc is session outtakes and jams. Again, to me, it's a gray area. The difference between some of the stuff that was on CD5 as opposed to CD3, the first demo disc, mm. uh, what makes an outtake, what makes a demo, what makes an alternate version. Um, but, you know, I, ha I have to make mention of the first track on the session outtakes and jams, which is take 14 of Isn't It a Pity, which um, one of you alluded to already, but the lyric is, isn't it so shitty? how we do so many takes now we're doing it again, mm -hmm. which was pretty cool. Pretty funny. Uh, and wedding bells, his version of wedding bells is fun. I got the impression it kind of broke into it kind of as a joke and uh, included it here. Uh, again, what is life better without the horns, some great guitar playing. I want to say it sounded to me a little like it could have been Clapton playing, uh, playing on that take of what is life. Uh, but I'm not sure that's just on first listen. Uh, some you mean, of the solos, you mean uh, the familiar riffs, the da 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 da, da that no, part? no, there were little, little bit solos kind of weaving in and out there. Um, I thought my could have been, it could have been Eric Clapton. Huh. Um, but again, uh, without doing any more repeating what you guys said, we we kind of heard all the same things on on the three discs of uh, demos and outtakes. 
And um, that's basically it. This I've absolutely loved it. This is a fantastic listen from beginning to end. Um, and again, it really shows how how much George was underappreciated, I think, even by some of his fans for mm -hmm. decades listening to this. Um, I just hope that they, uh, that Danny and Olivia feel that there's need for other sort of examinations of some of his other albums. Um, I think the safe bet is to say, I bet you there is some, some more stuff from the vaults that'll come out in the future. Cause I'd love to see how, you know, how, how he pieced together some of his other albums. But um, this is, this is great. This is a, this is a George fest and then some, <laughs> so. Well, we do know that there was that press release that came out before COVID where um, Danny and Olivia talked about plans for George's early material through 74 to be reissued. So, I have a feeling, and I, that's got to include 75 with extra texture too. So, and they, they were even talking about the 74 tour. So, you know, one of the frustrating things about dealing with all things was past, and you can say the same thing about living in a material world, is that it lists all the musicians, but it doesn't break it down on each track who's playing what. So you have to read as much as you can. Um, I've been watching a few of Bobby Whitlock's videos where he seems to have a pretty good memory of everything that he played on um, and reading the, the new book from Ken Womack and Jason Krupa and, uh, you know, listening back to my interview with Alan White and trying to piece it all together. But it's a shame that that wasn't, you know, documented for every single song. And uh, we'll get the same thing on living in the material world, I'm sure. You know, you have to figure, if you know the styles of some of these musicians, I know that's got to be Klaus Foreman, or I know that's Nicky Hopkins there on that song. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really wish it would be defined on every single track who's playing what. Yeah. So sometimes they didn't write them all down. Um, uh, in addition to... Um, Ken and, and Jason's book. Uh, there were a couple of other articles out that, you know, are, are worth looking at. Um, Matt Hurwitz has a huge overview of the album and how it was recorded with a lot of interviews and, and quotes from, you know, Bobby Whitlock and others uh, in um, Sound and Vision magazine that just came out. Okay. Um, Jeff Slate has one as well. I, I can't remember uh, the magazine, um, but if you do a search for Jeff Slate and all things must pass, it will it will come up. Um, and, and that was a good overview too. I mean, both of those give a lot of information about the recording process and uh, and Matt's especially. I mean, because Matt's is so long. It, I mean, it, it 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 took me a couple of hours to read, which for an article is is a lot, you know. Um, so, uh, what magazine was that again? Sound and Vision. Writing it down. Okay. Um, you know, and I was thinking as well uh, uh, that you know, I mean, in a way, we've we've said what we think about all things must pass as an album, um, and Darren uh, just said, you know, is it's, it's like an incredible George fest. Um, but I, I was thinking when we were all talking about this, that, you know, maybe we're sort of missing the forest for the trees in a way, you know, because we all know all things must pass and probably all of our listeners know all things must pass. So we're talking about the details of this set, but um, the album itself is, you know, it, it stands up over 50 years really well. Uh, in fact, it may be better now than it was when it came out. It was great when it came out, but, but I think it's, uh, it's become something else. And it, it, it's, if you sort of, I was trying to sort of take apart what its elements are, you know, and if you look at it, you, you've got, you know, these country things with Pete Drake, um, and the country things have a bit less specter too, you know, but you see also the roots and it literally is the roots of uh, Ringo's Bukusa Blues, because mm -hmm. it was during the sessions that Ringo got talking with Pete Drake 
And Pete Drake said, why don't you come to Nashville and, you know, make an album. I'll, I'll work on it with you. Um, so that's like a direct link. Um, there are songs that are still sort of from the tail end of the Beatles, you know, Apple Scruffs, which also is, you know, George's friendship with Dylan, you hear in the harmonica, you know, an acoustic guitar part. It's a, it's a very Dylan-y kind of song, not a song Dylan would have actually written though, you know, um, mm -hmm. But it refers to, you know, the Apple Scruffs hanging outside Abbey Road. And, you know, George has a, a reputation sometimes for being a little bit grumpy about Beatles fans. Um, but this was really kind of a, a nice tip of the hat to the people who, you know, are that devoted to them that they're just hanging out there. Um, Wawa uh, is also, uh, you know, I think we did, I don't know if we talked about it in the last show or the one we did with Hudson, but uh, uh, you know, it was written the day that George walked out of the Let It Be sessions, January 10th, 69, um, <clears throat> and uh, refers to both the Wawa pedal and Wawa as a, a, a headache. You know, he has said, I don't know if that's common anywhere or just his, his thing, uh, but, uh, you know, and there are a, a bunch of other things on here that, you know, if you start thinking about, you know, does this, this is really about the Beatles or is it about what it appears to be about, you know, isn't it a pity for instance, you know, isn't it a pity the way we cause each other pain, you know? Uh, and then you've got the play out of it, which is basically the same as the end of Hey Jude. And we know that George and Paul had a thing during the recording of Hey Jude, where George wanted to play a little, uh, you know, funky riffs in between lines. Paul didn't want it. And it came up again in the Let It Be sessions when he says, you know, I'll, I'll play whatever you want. Or, you know, like in Hey Jude, I won't play anything at all. Obviously was on his mind, you know, that stuck. Um, and I, I think that the fact that the end of Isn't It a Pity is also the end of Hey Jude is not a mistake. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of Beatle tea leaf reading that you can do in this album and the country stuff and the Rocky stuff. And, and then sort of tying it all together is that whole sort of spiritual thing that, that we were talking about. Um, and that stuff to me really is the heart of the album. Um, and it, uh, you know, it's uh, in, in 1990, um, when my father was diagnosed with um, cancer and we were told he had like two years, um, one of the first things I did was take All Things Must Pass off the shelf and give it a spin and, you know, the art of dying and all of that stuff, you know, and I found it really helpful. You know, I mean, because just because it's not because it's giving advice, but it's offering a philosophy. And from there, I went on to read the Bhagavad Gita, um, because I know that that's what inspired this. Um, and there is this one section uh, in the beginning of that where uh, Krishna is talking to Arjuna, who is a prince, uh, Arjuna uh, and is about to fight a war that he doesn't want to fight. And Krishna's telling him, no, you have to, you know, and Arjuna is saying, but I have relatives on both sides of this, you know, it's just going to be destruction. I don't want to do it. And Krishna says to him, I've been here many times and so have you, but I remember my past lives and you don't. Um, George doesn't say that specifically in this, but somehow I tie all of that up with this album, you know, and because of that, it's, you know, very obviously personal experience that I had revisiting the album in 1990. Uh, um, but, you know, that for me, the fact that he's talking about serious stuff, about what life is, about what life and death are, um, about what our condition on the planet is, really makes this a, a, a very special album for me. And it's something that, you know, much as I love the other Beatles, none of them, it wasn't their thing. 
it was George's thing. And this is, this is what he gave us. And it really, I, I think was a gift, you know? That's one of the beautiful things about the Beatles is that they're all so different as individuals, as people and in the music that they put out. And nobody has ever blended the spiritual with rock as effectively, I think, as George Harrison has. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about uh, Beatle connections and the songs, I don't believe George ever came right out and said it, but Run of the Mill is supposed to be about Paul. And if you look at the lyrics, yeah. it seems to point towards their relationship, you know, and uh, it makes you wonder what was going on with the two of them. Why didn't they get along or why did George have these feelings? But um, every now and then you'll see surveys amongst Beatle fans, what the best solo Beatle album of all time is. And most people usually place this one number one. We all have different tastes and they're all valid, but you could always understand why some people would pick this one. There's nothing better. The only thing better than having one great album is having two great albums. And this is two albums of really strong material. And along with that comes the whole backstory of how George was held back in the Beatles and he only had his two songs or at the most three on Revolver, you know, when John and Paul dominated everything. And in truth, that's also because John and Paul were more prolific. And it was only towards the end that things were really picking up for George that he was writing a lot of material. And so as George has talked about this album, he was having diarrhea at this time. It was this outpouring of so much material. It is fascinating to me to think that that Isn't It a Pity and Art of Dying were written in 1966. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't really hear those songs on Revolver, but those songs are so ahead of their time, and yet so much of what the Beatles were doing were ahead of their time anyway. But you have songs from 1966 on there. You've got songs towards the end of the Beatles. You've got songs from 1970. And George is also, at the same time, writing other songs for people like Billy Preston, you know, collaborating with Billy Preston and for Doris Troy. And what a productive period it was at this time for him. Jackie Lomax, you know, um, he was so active at this time in 1970. And this was just an outpouring right here. You know, if he had worked on some of these other songs that I think had potential, he could have had three albums of his own material there um so it's um it, it's it's quite something to behold you know witnessing this this artist blossom the way that george harrison did and this is you know the greatest example of that i can see art of dying on revolver really yeah um only thematically not not so much in the arrangement we know from this but you know think about it she said she said i know what it's like to be dead uh, okay and turn off your mind relax and float downstream it's not dying i mean the, the the there's there's a little whiff of death through various parts on eleanor rigby um you know mm. uh, there, there's <laughs> it, it could have fit you know it could have fit it could have been you know george's view of what these other songs are sort of getting at in a way. It would have been interesting. Yeah. It would have been a Beatle arrangement. I'm so used to hearing the arrangement on all things was fast mm -hmm. and I can't really hear that on revolver, but. And of course in 1966, isn't it a pity wouldn't have had that. Hey Jude ending. <laughs> That's true. Somewhere I read, it might've been, there was an interview in MSN about this new box had coming out. And just where's the effect that John didn't like, isn't it a pity? Specifically John. Interesting. And I guess that was, that was why it, they didn't work on it. I can't imagine why. <laughs> How can you not like, isn't it a pity? Such mm -hmm. a great song. But it's still, I don't know if it's a question of whether he genuinely didn't like it or didn't feel it was appropriate for the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Excellent points, both of you, and I think mm. that's a great way to put a wrap on our All Things Must Pass 50th anniversary show here on things we said today. So um, we'll be getting into um, 
more All Things Must Pass in a future show. Uh, and Ken, you've, you've alluded to uh, the new book that has been published. And I guess we could say that we intend to talk to the authors of of uh, of this new book that deals with George and uh, the title of it again, Ken. All things must pass away. Right. Harrison, Clapton, and other assorted love songs. Mm-hmm. So uh, that'll be in an upcoming show later in the month. We'll have uh, the uh, authors Ken Womack and Jason, Jason Krupa. Krupa. So anyway, let's go around the horn. And uh, get your contact information and put a wrap on things, starting off with Alan. Okay. You can contact me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can write to all of us uh, by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Uh, we have a Twitter feed uh, at things we said fab. Uh, we have a couple of Facebook pages, Things We Said Today and Beatles, and sorry, Things We Said Today, Beatles radio fans. Um, you can find the podcast itself, uh, various places on Podbean, on YouTube. Um, you should subscribe to us if you want on either of those. Uh, and also on iTunes, Um various other places uh, where fine podcasts can be found. And um, of course, if you're listening to this, you probably already know how to find it. So there you go. Hmm. All right, Ken. Uh, my email address is every little thing at att.net. I do want to point out that um, there's actually another things we said today show that's already out there that you might not even know about actually technically it's not a things we said today show but it's all three of us Mm -hmm. uh being joined by hudson ranny and martin quibell and they have a new podcast show called p2 podcast blues instead of p2 vatican blues and it's a solo george harrison podcast and we just did a show with those two guys so it's the five of us all talking about gontrapo so if you can check that out, P2 Podcast Blues. Also look up the name Hudson Ranny, R-A-N-N-E-Y. One of the youngest podcasters out there. He's only 14 years old, really into all this stuff. And speaking of Hudson, I did an interview with him uh, with Youth, the guy who collaborated with Paul for the Fireman albums. And that's on Hudson's other podcast show, which is called I Know I Know, named after the John Lennon song. Okay, so uh, we got that going on. We do have, you mentioned Ken Womack and Jason Krupa uh, on the other podcast show, uh, Talk More Talk, where I co-host the show with uh, Kid O'Toole, Tom Hunyadi, and Joe Mayo. Ken, Ken Womack and Jason Krupa will be our guests this coming Monday night live on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast at 9 p.m. Eastern time. So. We'll be talking with them on that podcast show. We'll be talking with Ken and Jason on this podcast show. And even after that, I'm going to be interviewing them together. So plenty of Ken Womack and Jason Krupa to go around. Elsewise on my uh, website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget Beatles trivia every single week. There's so much new stuff that I have to give away. Ram on the Ram tribute that was uh, co-produced by Denny Sywell and Fernando Perdomo. There's the McCartney 3 Imagined CD to give away. The book that we've been mentioning, All Things Must Pass Away, from Ken Womack and Jason Krupa. We've mentioned their names more than our own. And uh, I have the book to give away on the website. And I also have uh, another new book called Beatles 100, 100 Pivotal Moments in Beatle History by John Borak to give away. And that's through my weekly Beatles trivia. Happens every single week, runs Monday through Sunday. And all different types of Beatle games or trivia featured on my page, on my website. And you can pick from one of 10 prizes. And I just mentioned four of them. Okay. So uh, I got all that going on. And uh, and then, uh, then again, one more thing, my YouTube channel, which is just called Ken Michaels Radio. In addition to the recent interview with Alan White, I also interviewed Matthew Street. I never got to ask him 
you know, that can't be his real name. But um, Matthew does his own YouTube channel. It's been around for five years, all about the Beatles, talks about what's going on in the news, reviews albums, old and new. And we did a fi uh, Fab Five show on uh, my YouTube channel, which uh, I'm hoping Darren will be on shortly. And uh, that should be happening pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Is that it, Ken? That's all. I'm kind of lazy lately. Um, as for me, I have nothing to give away unless somebody <laughs> wants the pens that I used when taking my notes for today's show. Um, well, I, I could throw the highlighter I used too in there. Uh, I'm Darren DeVivo, and you can listen to me on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights. I go on at 10 p.m. Saturdays, I'm on from uh, 1 to 4 p.m. Again, in the New York City area, 90.7 FM. And um, it's there's an HT2 channel. You can uh, stream us WFUV.org. You can get a listen anywhere. Uh, download our app and listen there. If you want to send me an email, you can email me directly if you want to write to me so we can exchange messages and talk about Alan and Ken. Uh, you can email me at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, and I have two Facebook pages. Um, just Google Darren DeVivo. You'll probably find the other one as well and uh, reach out, send me a friend request or follow and uh, I'll get you all hooked up and we'll hang out on Facebook. So that's, uh, that's the deal. So that's it for this all things must pass 50th anniversary box set edition of things we said today. Thanks so much for spending time with us and uh, listening to us. Yap away about one of the great records ever made. I'm Darren DeVivo. For Ken Michaels, for Alan Kozin, I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.